is Ted Stankwich, and I'm an associate professor and the director of the Mammal Lab at Cal State Long Beach. Thanks so much for joining us today. In the Mammal Lab, we conduct scientific research on predators and prey and how they interact. We study how skunks defend themselves from predators like coyotes, the evolution of amazing defenses like spines, armor, and stinky sprays, dangerous weapons like horns, antlers, and tusks, and how mammals like coyotes, raccoons, and opossums are adapting to living around us in big cities. We'll talk about all that work and more today, and then I'll be back to answer your questions live after the video. So mammals have evolved many different strategies to avoid being captured by predators, from high speed running and hopping, to using refuge like burrows and trees, to forming large groups for early detection and defense, to more advanced defenses like sprays and skunks, armor and armadillos and pangolins, and spines and porcupines and hedgehogs. In the Mammal Lab, we ask questions about why these types of traits have evolved in some groups and in others. To do this, we, use, we need to measure the defense in some way to put a number on how strong that defense is and to be able to compare species. We visited museums all around the world to measure the preserved skins of as many different species as we can. This might involve simple tools like calipers to measure the length and thickness of spines of echidnas and hedgehogs and the quills of porcupines. These spines can be extremely sharp and powerful and some of the largest porcupine quills have even been known to kill leopards. When calipers won't work, we also employ state-of-the-art methods like cat scanning. Here a master student is organizing skins of armadillos and pangolins into bundles to put into a human-sized scanner. They take thousands of images in very thin slices, and then we digitally reconstruct the animal on the computer. With these scans, we can measure how thick and strong the armor is. If we get enough data from a lot of different armadillo species, we can begin to use advanced statistical tests to determine how different things like predator risk, temperature, and habitat might favor stronger and stronger armor in these species. These scans can also produce amazing 3D models of the surface of the armor that we can use to study how strong it is and how it performs under the pressure of a predator's bite. In the Mammal Lab, we also love studying the behavior of wild animals. Two years ago, we traveled to Western Australia to study these amazing echidnas in the wild. Echidnas and the duckbill platypus are the only mammal species that lay eggs instead of giving birth to live young. But echidnas also happen to have these really cool spines all over their body and can roll up into a ball to defend themselves. We did research on how these critters respond to approaching predators and how these responses might be related to their strength and speed. When a predator is upon them, they will hunker down into a ball or start to quickly dig into the dirt, trying to wedge themselves under a log or a rock. But this one was pretty easy to capture. But we don't stop at defenses. We're also interested in the evolution of offensive weapons that mammals use to fight over mates. Many male hoofed mammals use antlers or horns to fight over territory or the ability to mate with females. Our lab looks at how these weapons grow and evolve with body size. You're probably all familiar with antlers and horns, but you might not have heard of deer that have tusks instead of antlers. This is a Chinese water deer from the genus Hydropodes, and they, along with a few other groups like mouse deer, musk deer, and muntjacs, slash and slice with very sharp curved canine teeth instead of antlers. In fact, muntjacs like this one are the only animals with both tusks and antlers. They grapple with their antlers, trying to lift their opponent's head up in the air before they deliver a slash to the neck or body with their tusks. Like with defensive armor, we go to museums and study skulls of these species, measuring the antlers, horns, and tusks. We're finding that antlers and horns increase in size much faster than body size, showing that the larger you are, the more you need to invest in a huge weapon. In fact, it's the small secretive species that live in forests and protect small territories that fight with tusks, while the big species that live in open grasslands use large antlers and horns to advertise their fighting ability. It's kind of like how if you were surprised up close in a back alley, you would want to have a small knife that you could stab quickly with. But a big broadsword would be great if you're in the open, because the sword might scare off opponents and help you avoid fights before they start. We're also measuring the brain sizes of species with special armor and weaponry and finding that if species invest more energy in constructing these large elaborate structures, they have less energy to invest in large brains. It just goes to show that if you're well defended or have a big weapon, you have less energy to build a big brain and you probably don't even need one. Okay, now I mentioned earlier that in the mammal lab, we love to study skunks and other stinky mammals. Skunks live all over the United States and have this great stinky spray defense that, to stop predators from attacking. I think we all know what that smells like. But what most people don't realize though is that their black and white stripes are actually an advertisement to predators to stay away. This is an example of a warning coloration called aposematism, where animals use bold color patterns to warn predators that if they attack, they will experience some sort of unpleasant response like a stinky spray, sharp spines, or the toxin in the skin of the animal. So we're interested in how these stripes work and how predators learn to avoid skunks. First, most skunks around Southern California have two nice long white stripes down their body like this one. But in some places in the country, skunks vary from being mostly all black to almost all white. 
This is really interesting because previous research has told us that when prey species use warning coloration, it's best when all members of the population have the exact same pattern, so the predator learns much faster to avoid them and makes fewer mistakes. So why do skunks vary so much? Well, we studied skunks in museums from all over the country and found that stripes vary more in places where there are fewer predators around. This shows that when we remove predators and relax the natural selection to have consistent stripes, they start to vary a lot more. That's very cool. But we're taking it a step further and now looking at how live coyotes learn about skunk stripes. We do research at a special facility in Utah where they have a lot of captive coyotes in big natural outdoor pens. We first put portions of their food on brown furry plates to get them used to eating off of the models. Then, once they do that, we give them a skunk colored plate with a remote controlled sprayer inside. Then when they try to eat the food, bam, we can spray them in the face with skunk oil. This video shows what happened when they tried to eat the food. This animal, once it got sprayed, never tried again. Some learned to avoid skunks after one spray, others got sprayed nine times and kept coming back. So there's a lot of variation in their learning about warning coloration. Now we're studying how the pattern and contrast of coloration affect coyote learning and willingness to attack prey using a new set of models. In addition to warning coloration, we studied the other types of black and white mammals, like the evolution of the black and white fur and giant pandas, and found that because they don't hibernate and are active in both winter and summer, these animals likely have white fur to blend into the snow and black legs to blend into the shady forest in summer. This coloration pattern probably breaks up their body outline and helps them blend into their surroundings, a process called disruptive coloration, Hi everyone, my name is Tim. Thousands of different types of animals in every type of habitat. We also looked at the evolution of zebra stripes and found that stripes probably evolved to help them avoid bites by small parasitic flies. These flies are particularly abundant in the areas where zebras live, and the stripes apparently disrupt the vision of the flies, making it harder for them to land on their bodies. Pretty cool, huh? But back to skunks. We're one of the few labs in the country that actually studies skunk behavior in the wild. We're interested in how skunks perceive fear of different types of predators. So we go out at night and observe their responses to different predator cues. This is Obi-Wan Coyote, our coyote robot. He's remote controlled and has thermal and infrared cameras on the front, so we can get a predator's eye view of what attacking a skunk actually looks like. Here's an image from the thermal camera. You can see the warm-blooded skunk glowing bright red against the cool green trees and blue grass. We can take them to open parks at night where there are a lot of skunks and approach them to see how they respond to predators behaving in certain ways. Sometimes the model approaches alone, other times we walk alongside. We film these trials using only infrared light and a special camera. That's why this clip looks purple. There's no white light and it looks totally dark in person. In this clip you can see Obi-Wan slowly approaching in from the right side of the screen and the skunk will perform some characteristic defense and warning behaviors. Tail up, foot stamping, scraping, and then decides to run away. Skunks don't want to spray if they don't need to and will often just run away if given a chance. But if they're surprised or backed into a corner, they'll spray to defend themselves. We then bring these videos back into the lab and use special software to tag individual behaviors so we can better analyze the responses. In addition to this night work, we've spent six years live trapping over 150 skunks to study their population in sneaky sprays. We use live cage traps baited with tuna to trap them overnight. Then sedate them in the morning so we can take measurements, record their sex and reproductive state, then collect hair samples and some of their noxious oil. They wake up about 20 minutes later and we release them right back where we found them, with some bright colored dye marks on their stripes to let us identify individuals later. These punk rock skunks go back to their dens and sleep for the rest of the day. Finally, we're interested in how human activity and the gradual development of wild land affects the presence and activity of different mammal species. We use remote wildlife cameras like these to passively monitor wildlife all over Orange County, California. The cameras are small and battery powered. This sensor detects movement by an animal passing by and activates the camera. These infrared lights then turn on and the camera takes pictures and or video from the lens here. We leave them out for a month to capture thousands of images in that time. We have 26 cameras all over Orange County running right past Disneyland and Angel Stadium. The cameras are on the line from highly developed urban and suburban areas to semi-urban and totally rural areas with no development. We partner with the Urban Wildlife Institute in Illinois and are one of 30 partners with similar camera trap lines in different cities all over the U.S. and Canada. With these data, we can ask questions about how animals adapt differently to changes in green space and human density as the landscape changes from rural to urban. In the developed areas, we see raccoons and skunks, opossums, coyotes, squirrels, and rabbits. But as we get out into the rural areas, we see all these, plus bobcats, deer, foxes, and even mountain lions. 
Unfortunately, sometimes our cameras even get caught in wildfires, but not before capturing amazing footage of how quickly a fire can spread when it's windy, as you can see in this sequence of images, and the amazing flames from within a fire. In addition to studying how urbanization affects where animals live, we want to know how it affects their bodies too. We've been dissecting and measuring heads of coyotes that were hit by cars or put down by licensed pest controllers to study how eating different food in cities might have affected their skulls and bites. We're comparing coyotes from the urban areas of Los Angeles to coyotes from a more rural population near Fresno. Coyotes are omnivores naturally, but have large slicing molars and sharp canines for killing small mammal prey. We dissect and measure their muscles and the lip levers in their jaw to see if city life has made their bites stronger because they're now eating cats and small dogs too. Or maybe their jaws are weaker because they're eating softer human garbage and pet food. Generally speaking though, we're, we hope to better understand how urban living is reshaping the animals living among us. We're excited about the work we're doing and thank you for listening in. You can find us at our website here where you can read all about our research and our research team and maybe even leave a donation to support our future mammal work. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Now stick around and I'll be answering your questions live coming up next. Thanks again. Hi everyone again, I'm Dr. Ted Stankwich. I am the director of the Mammal Lab and professor at Cal State Long Beach. Um, thanks for tuning in to watch our video. Uh, you can submit your questions to the chat. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about our research or just about mammals in general. Uh, so fire away. Um, okay, so the first question is, um, have you ever been sprayed by a skunk? Uh, actually, one time, we've been trapping for about six years and uh, we've had a couple spraying events I've been sprayed once. Uh, and so the the uh, what happened was we had a skunk in a trap, and as they wake up from their their sedation, um, they they wake up in the trap, and so we have to release them afterwards. And uh, one animal, uh, you you hold the door open for the skunk, and it has to walk out. One animal didn't want to walk out. Um, I got tired of holding the door. The door slammed shut, sprayed my hand, um, and uh, so I got sprayed once on my hand in six years. So that's a pretty good record. Um, and so I get asked the question a lot, um, does tomato juice work as a way to get rid of skunk oil if, you're, if you say your dog's going to spray? Uh, no, T the tomato juice is, thing is a myth and it actually doesn't do anything. It makes um, the, the, the odorant particles of tomato juice just take up the same receptors in your nose as skunk oil. So what happens is you smell skunk, uh, you, you smell tomato juice and not skunk, but anyone else around you who just walks up smells both skunks and tomato juice. Um, what actually does work is you want to oxidize the thiols in the skunk oil, um, and it's a mixture of, of um, hydrogen peroxide, baking soda, and liquid dish soap that you can, if you go to my website, you can find it or just you can um, Google it, and it will, um, that will totally get rid of skunk oil. Don't use water. Water makes it worse. Um, so, so those are two, two things you, you, um, that I want to point out. Bleach also works well, but you don't want to use bleach on, on an animal or on your own skin. Uh, but you can use it on your on your deck or the walls of your house if, if it gets uh, skunk spray on it. All right, um, how have animals adapted to cities and other human establishments? It's a great question. Um, so animals have adapted quite well living around us, some not others. So if you look around us in Los Angeles, the things you see a lot of in terms of mammals are coyotes and raccoons and skunks and opossums and some squirrels, um, mice and rats, those kind of things. Um, certain species like those do very well around humans. They tend to be um, uh, more bold species, less fearful of humans, um, what we call generalist species, things that can eat a lot of different things. And so uh, they, they're the ones who do best because they can adapt really well to a new environment and, and the stresses of living amongst humans. Things that don't do well uh, are things like uh, mountain lions and bobcats. They're much more fearful of humans and, and don't really come into our, our uh, major urban areas. So um, they, things that do live, a, a li live among us um, do well um, in small patches of habitat. Uh, they can find small little green areas or thickets of bushes or overgrown yards and live there, um, li live under houses. Things that don't do well, like a mountain lion, for instance, they need a large expanse of land, huge uh, green areas um, without much development in order to, to really have a, a big enough territory to hunt and, and survive well. Uh, are the animals hurt when you capture them? Absolutely not. We've never had an animal get hurt during capture. Um, the animals go into a live trap. They, they uh, um, go in there overnight. We get there in the morning and we, um, uh, we check them, make sure everything's okay. We do a sedation on them. Uh, they fall asleep for about 20 to 25 minutes 
and then um, we check their health, make sure their heart rate and respiratory rate is going well. We do measurements, we look for parasites, we clean them up, um, take and take some samples, and then they we put them back in the trap to wake up and, and wander away. So animals never get hurt, um, and uh, they're actually pretty easy to work with. Another interesting thing about skunks, when you have them on the table, skunks don't stink. Um, the actual animal itself doesn't stink. Their oil stinks, of course, but the animal itself just smells like any other furry little mammal. Um, so they do really, really good, good, good job of not getting that oil um, on their fur. Um, so uh, are your cameras camouflaged? They're camouflaged pretty well. They're, 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 certain, they're, not, they're not covered in leaves or anything like that, but they are sprayed brown and green. So you wouldn't notice them right away unless you were looking. Um, we do have thefts uh, in, in the more urban areas and some people have destroyed our, the cameras because uh, maybe they think that we're capturing activity that they shouldn't be doing. But um, in reality, we delete all pictures of humans off of the cameras before we, we, we do anything. So we, we, we never have any issues, but we do have cameras get, get stolen or, or, or vandalized um, because people see, uh, see them. The one thing that does show up is um, when, if it's nighttime and totally dark and the camera's activated, the infrared lights have a faint red glow. So um, oftentimes you can see the red glow of the camera and that might draw attention. Um, but the animals, might, you can also see, see the animals, will, that will also capture their attention. Why is there this faint red light um, uh, shining in my face? Um, do skunks see the infrared lights used for night vision? No, skunks, um, so wild animals don't really see well in, inf in infrared. Um, that's why we use infrared and not white light. So we have big white um, flashlights and floodlights we, we can use, but when you shine a big floodlight on, on a skunk, it, it spooks it and scares it away. That's why everything has to be, be done in infrared. So when we are, are observing our trials, we're looking at everything through the camera lens and the, the camera, the viewfinder, because that's what shows us what's actually happening out in the field. Um, if you just look out in the field, there's, it's just black. Um, so we're, 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 we're flying blind here and just trying to use the camera to, to, um, uh, to see what's actually happening with the skunk. Um, have your cameras been attacked by animals? Uh, not to my knowledge, the, the animals don't usually attack the cameras. Um, they might sniff or lick or, or bite a little bit, but um, they're not going to um, chew or damage it for any extended period. Um, yeah, most of the damage is done by humans. Um, uh, we've had cameras get burned and, and, and stolen and broken into and smashed up and destroyed. Um, yeah, it, it's the human animals that, that do the most damage to our cameras. Um, is that an ape skeleton on the left side of the screen? That's a chimpanzee right behind me. Yes, we have a chimpanzee. So behind me, this is a picture from our teaching lab at Cal State Long Beach. We have an amazing collection of bones and skins that we use to teach the students. I teach mammalogy, uh, so the study of mammals. This is part of our lab here. So we have a, a chimpanzee behind me. We have a tiger uh, directly behind me, and then a, a vicunia um, um, off, to, off on your right. Um, it, with, where the, you can't see the head, but that's a, that's a relative of an alpaca or a camel. So those are some skeletons we have in the lab. But we have a bunch of other stuff too, can, kangaroo, uh, dogs, cats, ostrich, that kind of stuff. So um, we have a really great teaching lab here. I, I encourage you, if, uh, once we're out of this pandemic, um, we have a lot of open houses and, and public events here at Cal State Long Beach. And um, we open up the mammal lab uh, um, for, for, for viewing and you can come in and touch things and hold things. and learn all about um, uh, mammals and, and, and birds too, and rep reptiles um, right up close, closer than you would ever get to see in an actual museum. Um, let's see. So has Obi-Wan coyote ever been sprayed? Um, uh, no. So one, one big misconception about skunks is that they want to spray you. Skunks actually, not to anthropomorphize, but don't want to spray you. They want to go about their business, not be disturbed, eat food, find food, move on. Um, so if you don't mess with skunks, they're not going to mess with you. And, and I often t tell pe people, if you get sprayed by a skunk, you've, you've either tripped over it because you didn't see it or you did something wrong. So um, um, because skunks don't want to spray you, that they, they, all they want to do is move about their business. They will give you lots of warning signs and, and behaviors prior to spraying. So um, the Obi-Wan co co Obi coyote, you, we've seen those behaviors you saw on the screen, the stamping, the scratching, the, the, the ha little handstands, and then they just run away. Um, so most of the time, they're, if they're attacked, they, they, will, um, they will spray those. That's the last question I can take. Thanks a lot. Hope you enjoyed it, and uh, have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.